for the listening to the Boing Podcast. Everybody's doing well on this Tuesday. You know, it's Tuesday, but I'm still riding the wave of the NFL weekend because what a weekend it was. We went into great depth on it yesterday. Um, and, you know, it was an hour and 23 minute podcast, but it flew by. Uh, it, I, I, I miss things. I, I definitely talked about it incorrectly at times just because there was so much going through my brain and you wait the whole day to get it out. Um, but what a weekend it was. I'm still trying to process, still thinking about the matchups this coming weekend. We have San Francisco going to LA for the third time, Cincinnati playing the Chiefs, uh, the second meeting this year, but the first one at Arrowhead Stadium. Uh, Stadium. But, you know, today is funny because it's we're almost at the end of January. And baseball would never be a topic normally, you know, in January, especially when they're currently in a lockout. Sure, they had a productive meeting yesterday about the state of next season, but we know how the Players Association of Baseball and ownership works. They don't mesh very well. And the likelihood of these two sides coming to some resolution that makes sense for both sides, I have my doubts. I do think we will see baseball in 2022. It's just a matter of if and when. But baseball is at the center of conversation today because of two people, really. And that would be Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens. Because later on today, Major League Baseball, the Hall of Fame committee, the writers, the voters, will vote on this year's Hall of Fame class. And for the past four or five years, it's been, well, two Bonds and Clemens get it. And no doubt about it, these two guys are special, special players. But there's the elephant in the room, and it's the biggest counterpoint to them entering the Hall of Fame in the room. And that would be steroids. And, you know, I've, I've made this argument before. When you see a Hall of Famer, you know it. It shouldn't have to be a, well, I think he's a Hall of Famer. I think he should get in. It should just be a well-known fact. And body of work, Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens are Hall of Famers, no doubt about it. Their play, their statistics, what they accomplished. Barry Bonds, the all-time leader in home runs in a single season. Roger Clemens, Cy Young's three different locations. All very impressive. But, and there is a but, these two used steroids. They used steroids to improve their game. And there is the point to saying, well, Barry Bonds would have been a Hall of Famer before using steroids. I don't disagree with that fact. But it doesn't change the fact that he was using steroids. It doesn't change the fact that Roger Clemens used steroids. It doesn't change the fact that Roger Clemens was in decline. And then he gets to, he leaves, gets to Toronto, and suddenly he's found the fountain of youth. Could that have been steroid use? Most would argue yes. And to me, this is the, it shouldn't be that big of a debate. It shouldn't be, well, it would be a shame if, if these guys don't get in, because I really don't view it that way. If you get caught using steroids, you should not be in any Hall of Fame. It does not matter what you did during your career prior to using the performance-enhancing substance. It only matters if you use the performance-enhancing enha substance, because you screwed over the other players that you were going up against. You made their statistics worse. You benefited from them just doing things the right way and you cheating the system. And you could argue in life that people that cheat the system live long and prosper. And you know they, they get rewarded for standing up to the man or whatever you wanna say. However, people and especially sports writers they have this opinion that they're really good people 
And I think writers get in their head, well, I'm not going to vote for Bonds because you know why? He was an asshole. He wouldn't, he wouldn't respond to my interview questions. He was a prick off the field. And it has less to do with steroids, which shouldn't be a criteria. To me, if I have a vote, it's simply because you cheated. Nothing more, nothing less. Because if you open Pandora's box, then you, the voters, you have opened it for everyone that has cheated, that will cheat, that has the idea of cheating, that they can get into the Hall of Fame. Jose Altuve is a great player. He won an MVP. He's a World Series champion. But he got caught cheating alongside the entire Houston Astros team. To me, Jose Altuve should never go into the Hall of Fame because it's the exact same thing. You cheated. Yes, one took steroids. You stuck a needle in your ass. The other, you tipped pitches. You knew it was coming. Both are illegal. And you both got caught. They are the same. They are not mutually exclusive. They're the same thing. You cheated and you benefited from cheating. If you want to cheat and you don't get caught, good on you. You know what? I'm sure there are baseball players that are in the Hall of Fame that have cheated. Ty Cobb cheated back in the day. He's in there. I get it. But there's, there's setting a standard. And Hall of Fame should be there for people that played the game the right way and that were fantastic at their sport. And were Barry and, and Roger Clemens excellent baseball players? Yes. Phenomenal. They had Hall of Fame careers before they used it, but they used it. And that's all that really matters here. I don't care how many home runs Barry Bonds hit. I don't care about his race with Sammy Sosa. Yes, I wasn't. It was in 97. I wasn't yet alive. But guess what? They were both juicing. And, you know, there's always this thought, well, I think David Ortiz juiced. That's, a, that's not my opinion. I've heard that, seen that written. I've heard that discussed on shows. Well, Big Poppy was a great hitter. One of the worst athletes to ever play the sport of baseball, but he was a great hitter. But what do I know? He never got caught. So to me, I look at his resume and I say, you didn't get caught with steroids. These other two did. That's, that's a difference. You had a good enough substance to either bluff Major League Baseball or you had enough, your inner circle was, was strong enough to find something that you didn't get caught. The fact that Alex Rodriguez is even up for the, for the Hall of Fame is a complete, it's complete idiocy to me. He's done great things since playing baseball. You know, he's on Shark Tank. Okay? He's a guest shark. Great. I, I love the show. He's not particularly that interesting. He does Sunday Night Baseball. Eh, snooze. But, you know, he started gyms. He dated J-Lo, got dumped, whatever. But you got caught twice after saying you didn't use it the second time. You got caught again. Two times using steroids and you're up for the Hall of Fame. That is just. And kudos to him because he's righted, you know, the fact that ESPN hired this clown and the fact that he's, you know, seems to be well liked around the world. You know, people felt sorry for him for getting dumped by JLo. I personally found it funny, but I mean, this is just craziness to me. I don't, I just don't get it. I don't understand why this is even a discussion. And there's some great writers in baseball that I respect a ton, like Jeff Passan. He's a fan, he works for the mothership. He's a great writer. I, I think he's fantastic at what he does. Bob Nightingale is another guy. He uh, writes for uh, USA Today. He has for a long time. And I'm looking at his Hall of Fame ballot right now. And kudos to Bob for releasing it. He has the courage to do it. He's got Bonds and, and Clemens checked off. Alongside David Ortiz, 
Jeff Kent. I love seeing Jeff Kent get a check because I think he's a Hall of Famer. And he's also got Kurt Schilling, Sosa. You know, I don't agree with, with Sosa. Kurt Schilling should be a Hall of Famer. Kurt Schilling didn't get caught using steroids. Kurt Schilling is being shunned because people don't like his politics. He said some really off-color things over the course of his career. He, you know, he's a, he's a Republican. But that, he was a Trump supporter. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't go into the Hall of Fame. I'm sorry. You supported a guy that most people don't like, okay? But that shouldn't be the reason you don't get to the Hall of Fame. You said colorful things. Do I think? You, Kurt Schilling may be, might be a bigot. I don't know, but he is a he was a fantastic postseason pitcher. He's got the third lowest ERA in MLB postseason history, and he's not in the Hall of Fame. He didn't use steroids. He was not a great regular season. He was an average, but in the playoffs, he was as clutch as it gets. But I look at, I'm going to go off Bob's list. And obviously he, I, I love that he releases. I, again, I give him a ton of credit. If I go off this list, I wouldn't have Bonds or Clemens. Mark Burley, great pitcher in Miami and a little bit in Toronto, no. Carl Crawford, no. Prince Fielder, no. Todd Helton, no. Ryan Howard, Tim Hudson, no. Torrey Hunter, no. Jeff Kent, I'm checking Jeff Kent. I think Jeff Kent is a Hall of Famer. Uh, he was a great player for, for the San Francisco Giants. Tim Lincecum, no. Morneau, Canadian, but no. Nathan, no. Ortiz, absolutely. Jonathan Papelbon, no. Jake Peavy, good pitcher, but no. Andy Pettit, another steroid user, no. Funny how he's not checked off, but the other two steroid guys are. AJ Przinsky, no. Manny, no. A-Rod, <sighs> Jimmy Rollins, no. Kurt Schilling, yes. Gary Shetfield, yes. Th those would be my only guys. And baseball is a, is a, you know, is a sport that, you know, a couple of years ago, there was no Hall of Famers. There was nobody voted in. That can happen. And I just look at this and it shouldn't be that big of a debate. And it's just, it's pretty simple to me. Those guys are great, great players, but they cheated the game. And I think people that truly love it should look at this and say, they're not in. They just aren't. And there will be an upcry because Barry Bonds didn't get into the Hall of Fame. But you won't hear it from me. Somebody I respect, I listen to, Dan Patrick has the same sentiment. He doesn't, you know, he, I'm 23, Dan's 65. He watched these two players' entire career. He doesn't think they should be in. It's tough. It's tough because you hear the name Barry Bonds and you say, he's not in the Hall of Fame. And I get it. I get it. But you also got to do research. You got to know what this guy did. I'm going to reiterate this. Character should have nothing to do with your Hall of Fame. You could be the biggest asshole in the world. That doesn't matter to me. It's about what you did on the field. Did you help your team win? Were you a winner? Because there are players that aren't nice people, but they, they're on winning teams. They get deep into the postseason or even win titles. But did you cheat? Did you win? Did you put up the numbers? That is what's the most interesting thing to me. And... We'll see what happens at the end of today. It's usually around 6.30, 7 o'clock that it's released. And if they're in the Hall of Fame, I won't cry about it. It's not going to ruin my day. But as a person that loves sports, as a person that follows it, that watches the game of baseball, it's important to me who gets into the Hall of Fame and who doesn't. The hall It's a Hall of Fame. It's not the Hall of Very Good. It's for the elite of the elite. There are people that will get, go into their, you know, where they grew up, the city, the New Brunswick Hall of Fame, if you go there, or, you know, the Cincinnati, wherever. That, that's fine. 
The Hall of Fame is for elite, elite talent. To me, this year, I have Jeff Kent, I have David Ortiz, and I have Kurt Schilling. Those are my three votes. You can, just for this process, you can vote to up to 10 players. Bob Nightingale voted for eight. And he made his vote public. Kudos to him. We'll see what happens today. But I don't think either of them are going to get in. I really don't. All right. We'll see. We'll see. It's going to be interesting for sure. What, what's to come? But um, we'll follow it as we go along here. Uh, we'll talk about it tomorrow here on To The Point. You know, I, I wanted to leave with baseball, but you get breaking news in the afternoon. It's not every day that, you know, one of the longest tenured head coaches in the NFL is departing a storied organization. And you could say this coach brought this city back to life. And, you know, news broke this afternoon that Sean Payton, the head coach of the New Orleans Saints for the past 15 seasons, is departing New Orleans and he's stepping away from the game, taking a break, if you will. And, you know, this was reported a few days ago by Albert Breer, Albert Breer, the Monday morning quarterback works for sports illustrated, but you know, I heard about it and I just, I thought, well, Sean Payton will be back. You know, Sean, yeah, he's thinking about it, but you know, it's Sean Payton. He loves to coach football, but as I look at it now, New Orleans is a team in transition. They are devoid of quarterback. The fact that Sean Payton got the New Orleans Saints to a 9-7 and seven record this season, despite no Jameis for half the season, Drew Brees retiring, playing Taysom Hill, Trevor Simeon, Ian Book, no Michael Thomas for the entirety of the season, no real tight end. Alvin Camaro is banged up. It might be his greatest coaching season he's ever had. But the team is not exactly primed for a Super Bowl run. Not only that, but they are in a division with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. It remains to be seen what will happen with Tom Brady. I think he'll be back, but maybe he won't. You know, if he does come back, Tampa's a big favorite. If he doesn't, this division is wide open. But for Sean Payton, I see two, one of two things happening. You know, this stepping away period will either be one of two things. Option one that I see is that Sean Payton is going to be hired by Fox for next season. Um, I look at that panel. You have Howie Long. You have Terry Bradshaw. I don't think either of them are leaving. You have Michael Strahan. And then there's Jimmy Johnson. And, you know, Jimmy's 78. He's still very good at what he does, but he's the coach on the panel. CBS is Coach Cower. Um, and I think, you know, Sean Payton, he would go great with, uh, he would be great at Fox. He could uh, do some interviews with the shows there, potentially undisputed. Uh, the herd with Colin Coward and he could join that panel and Jimmy would exit stage left. Again, he's 78 years old, spend some time with the grandkids and just go into retirement after a great coaching tenure. He's now in the hall of fame and some really great years at Fox. But I think Sean could take that coach role and I think he'd be great in the media because he's a great quote. I think he's really smart, obviously to be able to talk about offense or maybe Sean Payton would want to go in the booth. I really don't know. Uh, but I, I could see him more on the set. I think that's his element. You're around other, other players. You're, you're talking it up. It's a fun environment. You know, uh, Jay Glazer's there as well. But, you know, in the booth, they are pretty, pretty loaded. They got Mark Shalareth. Uh, they have, obviously, 
Troy Aikman and Joe Buck. They have Greg Olson, who they recently hired, who, who's fantastic. I thought he had a great rookie season um, in, in the booth. But I think Sean Payton would be a really good add to that panel. And that's where I see his option number one uh, is to go to Fox and be part of their, their um, pregame and then halftime shows, everything in between. And I believe that Fox has the Super Bowl next year. Because I think, yeah, I think uh, CBS had it when the Bucks won. So uh, next year in Vegas, I believe it's Fox's Super Bowl. So Sean Payton would be there um, for that as well. It's just another little cherry on top for, for hiring Coach Payton to, to the staff. Option two. Option two is, well, you know, you're stepping away. It's potential retirement, but those are just words and coaches, players, you know, Gronk was retired and guys retire and they come out of it because they want to keep playing. You know, Eric Weddle is playing for the Rams. He was retired for over over a year, but I could see him going to coach the Dallas Cowboys and you know, the Dallas Cowboys have had a lot, a few coaches over the last number of years, but none of them have the pedigree. None of them have the, uh, the cachet, have the offensive brilliance of Sean Payton. Jason Garrett was nice. Wade Phillips was nice. Mike McCarthy is a Super Bowl champion in his own right, but nobody would say that he has the football acumen of one Sean Payton. Sean Payton saw a wounded bird in Drew Brees who was told he was too short, didn't have a big enough arm. He was not going to be able to make the NFL. He was not going to be able to be a productive quarterback. And yet he said, you know what? Miami might have failed him in his physical, but I'll take this guy on because I think he's got the heart. I think he can do it. And what happened? Well, Drew Brees ends up finishing second all time in passing yards, second all times in, in completions, touchdown passes, and he ultimately won a Super Bowl, a future Hall of Famer. So Sean has an eye for talent. Also, a few years ago, I heard him interviewed on the Dan Patrick Show, and he said the Saints were getting ready to trade up to draft Patrick Mahomes, but they waited one slot too late. Kansas City ultimately traded up to 10, and they selected Mahomes. It changed the future of the NFL. Would Drew Brees have went elsewhere? Obviously, they would have moved off him quicker. And maybe, you know, obviously Kansas City would be a, a drastically different team than they are right now in their fourth straight AFC championship game. So it's funny how, how things work in sports. But Dallas, he coached in Dallas. He was the offensive coordinator for three seasons. They let him leave, and I think Jerry Jones regrets it ever since. He's tried to lure him back. And if he's going to leave New Orleans, I believe he will go to Dallas. Now, the one roadblock to going to coach in Dallas is Jerry Jones. And what I mean by that is Jerry wouldn't be mad that Sean Payton left. He was an OC. He took a head coaching job. Good for you. But Jerry Jones, we talked about this after the Cowboys lost a few weeks ago. Jerry Jones is the main reason why the Cowboys don't win anything. Jerry Jones has to be the spotlight. He has to be the center of attention. He has to hire a coach that's going to do what he says 95% of the time. Now, cuckolds are born every day. Yes, men are born every day. But Sean Payton's not one of them. Sean Payton's a made man. Sean Payton is going to do what Sean Payton wants to do to give his chance the best opportunity to win a football game. And if Jerry Jones doesn't like it, Sean Payton's just not going to care. He's going to do what he wants to do. He's going to run certain plays. He'll bring in, he'll make decisions that maybe Jerry doesn't like. So that's the one roadblock. That's why it's option two, because it, it would require Jerry Jones to not have both hands on the wheel. Sean Payton needs both hands on the wheel. He needs to be the leader. He's calling plays. He's making decisions. And Sean Payton, hiring him, 
it would eliminate, you know, Kellen Moore, the current offensive coordinator, if he gets a head coaching job, because with Sean Payton departing, there are nine, there are currently nine head coaching vacancies in the NFL, which is crazy. Nine. No one's been hired yet. Two GMs have been hired, one in, in uh, New York, one in um, Chicago. But we're still waiting on a head coach getting hired. New Orleans is now in the mix. But for Dallas and for Jerry Jones, maybe he doesn't want to, maybe he doesn't want to coach anymore. It is a grind, but money talks. That wouldn't be an issue. But to me, he'd go meet with Jerry Jones and say, look, Jerry, I love the team. I love the area. It would be an honor to coach this team, but back off. And I don't know if Jerry's willing to do it. Because Jerry talks about how much he wants to win a Super Bowl. He won three in the 90s. But Jimmy Johnson deserved, took a lot of the credit away from Jerry Jones. And what did Jerry do? He fired him. Because Jimmy was the genius. Jimmy was the football, the, the football man. He came from college. He turned the ship around. The Dallas Cowboys were a joke. Jerry didn't like that. Jerry wanted the credit. Well, ever since he got rid of Jimmy, they've won three playoff games. They haven't had any success. Very limited. They haven't gone to an NFC championship game since. And what's the common denominator? Jerry Jones sticking his nose in every little bit of business. And they haven't won. Now, you look at who they have right now, Mike McCarthy. Now, Mike McCarthy has won the same amount of Super Bowls as Sean Payton won. But it's crazy how they are looked at so differently. Because Sean Payton is an offensive genius. He can find diamonds in the rough. He creates great players. He's a great offensive play caller. He calls the plays in New Orleans. Mike McCarthy is, was an offensive mind at first. He was calling plays in Green Bay. Till the end of his tenure there, Rodgers was done with him, and he was ultimately fired. Since coming to Dallas, he has not called one single offensive play. He doesn't call plays. Kellen Moore has been the signal caller. So there is a difference. But when it comes to production, when it comes to their career, they're on equal playing fields. They both have won Super Bowl. But none, in saying that, it's a no-brainer that you'd want Sean Payton. To me, he's the most interesting head coaching availability in a long time. Because it's rare that New Orleans has you know, one Super Bowl in 15 years, but they're not firing him because he has an eye for talent. He knew Patrick Mahomes was going to be a great player. Another great coach in Andy Reid, who also only has one Super Bowl, said, I got to get him first. And he did. And it was a good battle. They took Marshawn Lattimore. He's a great corner, but it's rare that you get a generational quarterback. And we see what it can do for a franchise with Alex Smith, depart, uh, with Kansas City departing from Alex Smith, who is a first overall pick, mind you. Letting him go to Washington and taking Patrick Mahomes after a season where Alex Smith got the Chiefs into the playoffs. But maybe this is it. Maybe he retires. He goes to the booth. I do think he wants to talk football. He loves ball. I don't think he's done with the game by any means. Again, he's leaving now. So it would be a number of months before he has to start at Fox. And just looking at his age, he's, he's 58. You know, he just turned 58 years old. That's not a very, he has children. He's from the California area. But like I said, he coached in Dallas. 15 years he's leaving. He, you know, he leaves the, the team with a 152 and 89 record and a postseason mark of nine and eight. That's where, you know, that's the one mark that you'd want to improve on, obviously, is looking at him as a coach. But Ian Rappaport is reporting that Saints defensive coordinator, Dennis Allen, who is a former head coach, formerly of the Oakland Raiders, is considered the leading candidate to replace Peyton. 
which is interesting. Uh, Peyton had three years remaining on his contract, but, um, you know, he, he leaves the team. Dallas would have to pick up some money to get him obviously with three years left, but they would. Who knows where this goes? Who knows where Sean Payton ends up? Who knows where he go, where they go from here? But it certainly leaves an interesting little void in New Orleans because they're like a lot of teams in the NFL right now. They don't have a quarterback. They really don't because – Jameis Winston's coming off a torn ACL. Do they bring him back? He played seven games. You really don't know what Jameis Winston is, especially he's going to have a new offensive coordinator. Sean Payton was calling play, so it's another OC for Jameis Winston to learn. Trevor Simeon is not the answer. He's not, you know, he's not a quarterback that's going to bring anywhere. He's, he's a solid backup, but that's it. Ian Book, he was a rookie, fourth-round pick. I, I liked him at Notre Dame. I like more his legs at Notre Dame than his arm. He doesn't have a big arm. But could he be a Baker Mayfield type quarterback? Maybe. I wouldn't give up on book yet. He would be on my roster. Now, where this leaves Taysom Hill is an interesting, another interesting wrinkle to this. Because by all accounts, by all reports, Taysom Hill, the, the utility knife, jack of all trades, quarterback, tight end, running back for the for the aforementioned Saints has been Sean Payton's guy. He's been the guy, you know, getting them to sign him to contracts because Sean Payton was the GM as well. He loved him and he's, if he plays quarterback, he's due a lot of money. But what we've learned from Taysom Hill over the last number of years is that he can't play quarterback in the NFL, at least not at a high level. He's just not a good quarterback. He, he, I love him when he's a receiver or he, you know, he's a, or when he's blocking or doing different things, but not playing quarterback. But, you know, he's got a contract right now. Hills Neal deal is worth a reported 40 million over four years, and it could increase to over 90 million if he becomes the team's starting quarterback over the next four years. That's a terrible contract. That's Sean Payton's fault. And this contract is basically what. I would say what Peter Shirelli did to the Edmonton Oilers, leaving Miko, Miko Koskinen sitting there, basically taking a sky dump and leaving it on the books. Because the team that has the mo the biggest cap problem this offseason is the New Orleans Saints. But Green Bay coming, they have over 50 million they need to clear. You can do it, but it's not an easy job to do. And like I just mentioned, Sean Payton was the GM and head coach. So now you have to find somebody to come in, be the general manager with all this crap swirling around, find a new head coach, which maybe it'll be Dennis Allen. Maybe they'll hire internally, which I do think he's a good, very good defensive coordinator. I don't know if he's a head coach. Didn't work in Oakland. Some people are just meant to be coordinators. I think Dennis Allen's potentially could be one of those people. You know, he's got 20, Hill's got 21.5 million in guarantees. Like this is a terrible, terrible contract because it can only go poorly. He's do all, do all that money, and he's not a full-time receiver. He's not a full-time running back, so he's only in certain snaps because otherwise he's still going to want to play quarterback. Or the alternative is Taysom Hill is our starting quarterback week in, week out, which is a disaster scenario because he just can't do it, plain and simple. He's not a good enough player. He can't be your franchise quarterback. So – that's a Sean Payton contract that is terrible. It's going to hurt the Saints for many years to come, what they choose to do with him. But they probably have to hire Dennis Allen because this job isn't that luxurious. It isn't that appealing because there's bad contracts. The salary cap is eating away at you. You don't have a quarterback. You, you do have an elite defense with DeMario Davis, Marshawn Lattimore, Marcus Williams. You have pro bowlers on that side, Marcus Davenport, Cam Jordan. But we saw last year, there were nine and seven. You missed the playoffs. You need, sorry, nine and eight. You missed the playoffs. You need to have great seasons. They don't have a quarterback to get them there. Thankfully, they're in a bad division. Carolina, state of transition. Matt Rule is coming back. They just hired um, a new OC uh, down there in Ben McAdoo, former Giants head coach. But is Sam Darnold going to be their quarterback? 
uncertain there. Um, you look at the Atlanta. Well, Matt Ryan should be back, but they're not, they're not a good roster. They're not threatening at all. Atlanta is just a team that, that should lose as of right now, eight to 10 games next year. You don't expect them to be a playoff team. And then Tampa, this is why I think it's tough for Tom Brady not to come back is because the division is so weak. Now I do think it depends on what Tampa does with that roster this off season with free agents like center, Ryan Jensen, Chris Godwin, Leonard Fournette, uh, and Dominican Sue. I could Jason Pierre, Paul, I could go on, but it, it's a winnable division. You know, you beat Tampa twice this year with Tom Brady, a quarterback with one start having uh, Trevor Simeon, the other start having Taysom Hill, but they weren't able to beat the league consistently with that poorest quarterback play. So Sean Payton leaves. We'll see what his next moves are. And is it to another football? Is it to another NFL organization? Is it to Fox? Does the mothership want to hire Sean Payton? Does he want to work in the booth? Does he want to work in studio? We'll have to see where this goes in the next couple of months. But it's interesting nonetheless because of, you know, this, the status this man has, what he's done in his career, and, you know, what he's accomplished uh, down in New Orleans. Another football story that I didn't get to talk about enough yesterday, I don't think it was really discussed enough throughout the weekend. You know, it's one thing to win a game. I did talk about this game in, at length yesterday. But it's another thing to get sacked nine times and win the game. And Joe Burrow got destroyed on Saturday. Nine sacks. Pressured 22 times. It was a rough weekend for him when it comes to his body. Otherwise, but... What you could say about Joe Burrow and what I take from that performance in his season as a whole, Joe Burrow has balls. Joe Burrow has stones. He took nine sacks, hit after hit after hit, yet he remained in the pocket. He stayed patient. He didn't flinch and he continued to throw the football. He continued to scramble for first downs, to step up in the pocket, to stay in there, to you know, take a hit to make a play. That's Joe Burrow. This guy is cocky. He has swagger. And I'm sure opposing defenses would love to knock his head off because he's only in his sophomore season, but he feels like a 10-year veteran. But he's got the it factor. And you look at it, that offensive line gave up the most sacks in the NFL this season, during the regular season. He's been sacked 12 times in two playoff games. And yet, this roster, which picked fifth in the draft last year, selecting Jamar Chase, is now in a game away from the Super Bowl. Now you might say, well, Cincinnati would have, would have been better last year if Joe Burrow played the whole year. Okay. But still, it is so rare to see a team just first off win a division when your quarterback is sacked the most times. It is rare to see a team, an offensive line that gives up the most sacks. That said quarterback is top four in completions, passing yards, and passing touchdowns. And it just tells you that this young man, this young quarterback is made of the right stuff. He is the real deal. He is showtime. And, you know, I, you think forever, well, oh, what's going to happen to these leagues when, when, our, when the great players go away? You know, I thought about this in hockey. When I was watching Scott Niedermeyer and Nick Blitzstrom, like, oh, I love these players so much. What's the league going to be like when they're gone? You know, is there going to, then you see Victor Hedman and Adam Fox and Kale McCarr and great defensemen replace the great ones. You see it 
you know, up front, well, what's going to happen when, when, when Ovechkin retires or Crosby leaves? Well, McDavid comes, Dreisaitl, a new wave. And in the NFL, we saw Drew Brees leave. We seen Philip Rivers, Big Ben Roethlisberger's on the verge of retirement. Tom Brady's thinking about hanging them up. You know, of my generation, all the quarterbacks that you, you thought about, you, you just knew them. They were the goats of goats. But when we watch football on Sundays, do we miss Peyton Manning? No. Are we going to miss Tom Brady? I'm sure some people will, Patriots fans, when you're not winning a Super Bowl every other year. But my bigger point here is the league is so healthy because the quarterbacks coming into the game now are more prepared than ever to start, to be great. You look at this league, Patrick Mahomes, under 27 years old. Josh Allen, 20, 25 years old. Justin Herbert, under 25 Lamar Jackson, under 27. You're going, Joe Burrow. These young quarterbacks are the future. They are the next wave, and they are phenomenal at what they do. Trevor Lawrence hopefully can find that spark, but you can name five or six quarterbacks that are in the next wave. They're not Aaron Rodgers. They're not Tom Brady. They're the next, they're the young up-and-comers. They're the young whippersnappers, and they are phenomenal. And that's when you know your sport's in a healthy position because there's good quarterbacks across the board. And I look at the league right now, Derek Carr is a pretty good quarterback. But when you compare him to Joe Burrow, to Justin Herbert, to Patrick Mahomes, people think Derek Carr stinks. Kirk D. Cousins is a pretty good quarterback. But compared to the aforementioned names, he's chopped liver. But that just tells you what a healthy state the league is in. Because there's so much talent. There's so many good players. Randy Moss and Terrell Owens are out of the league. But Jamar Chase, Tyreek Hill, Justin Jefferson, Devontae Adams. There's no Shannon Sharp. There's no Tony Gonzalez. There's no Kellen Winslow. But there's Travis Kelsey. There's George Kittle. There's Mike Gusecki. The league is constantly changing. Leagues don't shut down when players depart. The sport continues to go. Wayne Gretzky hasn't played in the NHL in 20 years. And he'll still be known as the greatest player to ever play the game. But there's new players. There's people that want to take him head on and say, you know what, I was better than Gretzky. McDavid, Crosby, I'm sure think, my, my job to come in, into this league is not only tear it up, not only to you know, win championships, but I want to be, I want people to know, hey, I was just as good as Wayne Gretzky. I'm the great one, not him. And when Tom Brady retires, whenever that is, I don't think it's going to be this offseason, but in a few years, potentially next offseason, he'll go into the Hall of Fame. He'll be revered. We'll see him at football games, smiling, wave to the camera. And he'll be regarded as the greatest of all time forever. Michael Jordan is Wayne Gretzky. Baseball, it's a little bit more arbitrary. People might think Mike Trout's the best player to ever play the game. It, it, that's a tougher one. But in the big sports we're thinking of here, you still know who the greatest of all time was, but it doesn't make the present that, you know, less interesting. LeBron coming for the throne. But then you say, well, Kevin Durant thinks he's better than LeBron James. And then you see a guy like John, John Morant come to the league, and he's more athletic than any of these players that you've ever seen. And it's constantly evolving. And I just look at guys like Joe Burrow and Mahomes and Allen, and it's what makes the sport so special because you don't see a drop off. You don't, you don't go and say, well, uh, Tom Brady's, Tom Brady's retired. The quarterback play stinks. No. If anything, the position is stronger than it ever has been. You see some of the plays these guys make. The Mahomes throw the other night where he's basically sidearm falling to the ground. He whips it to Tyreek. It was one of the most impressive athletic things I've ever seen. Josh Allen, that two-point conversion, heaving it to the back of the end zone. 
I don't know how he did it. But the athleticism, the ability, the arm talent that these young guys have is what makes the league so fascinating. It's what makes it unique. It's what makes it fun. And that's, that's all you can hope for when you're watching sports. You, you want to tune in and say, okay, uh, I really miss these players. And do I miss watching Scott Niedermeyer? Yes, of course. Do I miss watching Terrell Owens? Yes, these are some of my favorite players. But I still, I get to go and say, holy shit, Joe Burrow has a set on him. He is the real deal. Joe, Joe Burrow is going to be a Super Bowl champion. He turned around an organization that was one of the worst in sports in a year and a half. Think about that. Do other people deserve credit? Yeah, Zach Taylor deserves credit. Their defense, they, uh, GM acquiring Trey Hendrickson, Sam Hubbard in the offseason, Mike Hilton coming over from the Steelers. Yes, but it starts at the top. It's, Joe, it's having that guy that you're like, okay. I heard Carson Palmer get interviewed yesterday, and he said what was so unique about Joe Burrow is you get sacked once or twice, quarterbacks react different. You're going to throw the ball away. You're going to not take a hit because it stinks to take those hits to take sacks. He never did it. He stayed in the pocket. He delivered throws. On their last pass of the game, he finds Jamar Chase over the middle after the Zach Wilson, uh, the, the, yeah, the Zach Wilson, uh, uh, intercept, Logan Wilson interception, sorry. Zach Wilson plays with the Jets. Um, he delivers that ball over the middle. He doesn't flinch. He doesn't get happy feet. That's Joe Burrow. That's, you watch this weekend and you just say, wow, what did we just see here? And there are games where you go, okay, well, Ryan Tannehill wasn't very good. Jimmy Garoppolo is not a great quarterback. There are games like that, of course. But then you get to watch guys like Burrow, like Mahomes, like Josh Allen, like Matthew Stafford with that deep chuck to Cooper Cup. And you go, this league's in a pretty healthy spot. But I just want to talk about Burrow because after hearing Carson Palmer talk, I'm just thinking about how many people are going to stand in the same position, not flinch when they know they're about to get hit. They know something's coming. Guys play differently in sports, and you see them change the way they play if they know somebody's going to come in and hit you. Seven-game playoff series, it's about attrition. Your body's hurting, and you don't want to, you, you're sick of getting hit of that guy. So you might make a play that's a little lazier, that's a little more high risk, because you don't want to take that hit. Joe Burrow did the complete opposite. He stood there, said, bring it. They sacked him, sacked him, continued to do it, and he, he didn't change. Now he heads to Cincinnati, he heads to uh, Kansas City this weekend. I don't know if he's going to win the game, but he's proven a lot of people wrong. He, he's gotten Cincinnati back on the map. And when he starts saying we're not underdogs, this is a yearly thing now. This is our expectations. It's the first time in a very long time that Cincinnati fans, that NFL fans, that people that like football should take heed and really respect this take, respect this message. Because it's one thing if you heard that from Andy Dalton, you'd scoff, you'd laugh for good reason. This isn't Andy Dalton. This isn't a Kirk D. Cousins. This is a great, great player telling you this organization might have stunk for a long time but I'm here now. And that is over. This season isn't over, but Cincinnati needs to address that offensive line. They need to pay a number of guys, but Joe Burrow, despite having Jonah Williams at, at left tackle, despite having guys that shouldn't be playing regular snaps, he has the guts to make it a game this weekend and we'll get to the picks later in the week. Ben Murray's going to join me Thursday night. We'll preview the games. But don't be surprised if you see Joey B have a big game and 
potentially pull off another upset this weekend at Arrowhead Stadium. Team Canada. And, you know, Team Canada, the Olympic Games. It's been something that's been talked about forever. You know, people aren't that excited about the Olympics. It's, you know, there's no NHL players going. So there's this, you know, uh, I don't want to watch these guys that don't play in the NHL. And I get that sentiment. But, you know, we knew NHL players aren't going for a while. There's still Team Canada. It's still the Olympics. And, you know, I, I said this from the beginning, I don't need NHL players to go. But I, I am, ex, you know, I'm excited for the tournament. I'm going to watch the hockey. It's in Beijing, so it's 12 hours ahead of us. Uh, or, yeah, it's 12 hours ahead of us. So it's, you know, it's going to be a big time change. The fine games are is going to be uh, difficult. You know, we're seeing that right now in tennis uh, with the Australian Open, obviously, being ahead of us as well. But, you know, you need to maneuver and you need to, to find it on your televisions. But Team Canada named the roster today. And I'll go through it here. At forward, you have Daniel Carr, former Montreal pick, Corbin Knight, Ben Street, former Stanley Cup champion, Jack McBain, Eric Stahl, champion Adam Tambellini, Eric O'Dell, Daniel Winnick, Adam Cracknell, Mason McTavish, the youngster, Landon Ferraro, son of Ray Ferraro, David DeArnay, Jordan Wheel, and Josh Hosang. Interesting. On defense, former Moncton Wildcat, Brandon Gormley, Matt Robinson, Alex Grant, former Moncton Wildcat, Mark Barbario, Owen Power, the uh, number one overall pick last year out of Michigan, Maxim Nero, who played at the last Olympic Games for Canada, Tyler Wotherspoon, and longtime NHL defenseman, Jason Demers. And then in goal, you have Devin Levi, the 19-year-old playing out of Northwestern, or sorry, Northeastern University, Edward Pascal, the former Atlanta Thrasher draft pick, and Matt Tompkins currently playing for Frölunda in the Swedish Hockey League. Now, this isn't this isn't a list full of guys that you're, you're gonna be like, wow, this is stack group. You know, all I can really say about this, I'm happy Mason McTavish and Owen Power being, I'm happy for these two. I was, I was obviously at the World Junior Championships. It gets shut down. These two don't get to finish their quest for a gold medal. So I'm extremely happy that both of them will have the opportunity to win a gold medal here for Canada. And, you know, McTavish and Power were both so dominant. Uh, We've seen Power play at the World Championships last year. He was playing 25 minutes a night. I look at this defense score. Yeah, you know, Gormley, Barbario, Nero, Demers, they've all played pro hockey. They've all played in the NHL some and now overseas. Owen Power, I expect him to play a ton of minutes. I watched him, at, like I said, I watched him at the G. He's such a good player. And maybe he won't from the start. Claude Julian's the head coach. He might ease him into this tournament. But I expect to see that guy, Owen Power, play 23, 24 minutes a night at the Olympics by the end of the tournament because he's that good. You're not going to be able to deny him. Mason McTavish, I believe, will also be playing top line minutes because I look at this team. You know, I think it's it's a very obviously it's a very good team, but you know, Landon Ferraro, not exactly a goal scorer. Jordan Wheel is more of a checking forward. Hosang will will be relied on offensively for sure. Cracknell is a fourth line grinder. Same with Winnick. Odell, uh, Eric Stahl, I think, will be asked to provide offensively. Tambellini will McBain. Corbin Knight, Ben Street has that ability. But McTavish, you're going to need somebody to score goals. And McTavish can do it. He's such a physical player. Um, my one big gripe with the team is that you know you can bring a taxi squad and basically it's six players that are going to be sitting out. If there's an injury or somebody gets COVID, they will sub in. Um, and on that taxi squad is Kent Johnson, who also plays at Michigan. He was at the World Junior Championships. He would be in my starting, he'd be in my top, you know, my top forwards for Canada. I don't understand why he's not. Um, I think he's better than a lot of the names I just read. I think you, a lot of guys fill the same position. Uh, I, I look at Winnick, I look at Cracknell, and I look at uh, Wheel, for instance. I think they're all checking bottom of the line forwards. And I say, Ken Johnson could provide something offensively. He was playing with Mason McTavish at the uh, World Juniors, 
maybe they can find some sparks. They can play together on the same line, the youngsters. So I, by the end of the tournament, he would be on the team for me. I, I just think he's too good. You have him sitting there, play him. But if the sentiment going into this tournament is, well, there's no NHL, there's not going to watch it. Well, I have two things to say about that. Number one, well, I watch hockey because I'm a hockey fan. Do you go watch minor hockey in your area? Do you go support junior B, women's hockey around the, around the world? You know, whomever you go watch uh, young kids play midget. Well, they're in NHLers. Likely every player on that ice is not going to be making the NHL. Many of them probably won't play pro. But you go watch. And if you're patriotic, if you say you love Canada, you want to watch, you, you want to watch them win gold, five for gold, well, watch them because they're representing your country, because it's hockey. Yes, it's not NHL, but it's still hockey nonetheless. And I think you have to appreci appreciate that. These players, number two, second reason, it's not their problem that the NHL players aren't going. They know nobody wants to see them. They want to see the NHL players. They want to see McDavid, Crosby, Ovechkin, whomever. But this is the hand that you're dealt. They can only play with the hand that they're dealt. And they, they get a chance to play for their country. Brandon Gormley was a great Wildcat. Do you think he ever thought he'd get this opportunity? You know, Ray Ferraro wrote on Twitter today you know, just how excited he was. Obviously, this is a, such a big deal. For a father to say, my son gets to go play for Canada at the Olympics. And this is what he said. Can't really describe what it feels like to see my son on this list. So happy and proud of him and experience I can only imagine. Good luck to everyone. And I can't believe I get to watch London, land and play in the Olympics. What if you were a parent of one of these guys? What if you got the opportunity to see your kid play? He might not be in the NHL, but he gets to experience something that many people would kill for. And I think you just have to appreciate, and I'm not trying to be Hockey Canada and do a, a, an ad here, but it's hockey. You throw in a game on a Sunday afternoon, some of them stink, okay? These guys are going to represent your country. There's a pandemic. There's COVID. There's rules in Beijing that are like fucking Al Alcatraz, but they're going. How about showing them some support? Because quite frankly, if you're only watching hockey and you're not going to watch this tournament because there's no NHL players, you're not a true hockey fan, in my opinion. You're not. You're an NHL blowhard. And are you really a hockey fan? Or do you just support the one team? Are you just a Sidney Crosby guy? You need to watch him at the Olympics. Or are you just a big fan of, of Austin Matthews, who remember? Some people just like hockey and we watch it, just watch sports. You don't need to have a certain player there for you to enjoy the game. Maybe you do. I think you're, I think it's wrong, but maybe that's, maybe that's what you need to watch games. I don't. I'm happy Mason McTavish gets to finish in essence, what he started at the world. Junior. He gets to play for a gold medal at the damn Olympics. Owen Power might have won an Olympic gold medal before he gets to the NHL. Imagine that. He might get there again because I think he's damn good. But he might get to, before he gets to Buffalo, he might have an Olympic gold medal around his neck. Wouldn't that be a great accomplishment? Dream, Eric Stahl had a great career. He was in the Stanley Cup final last year. What if he gets to cap off his career with the Olympic gold medal? What if Devin Levi gets starts lost in the gold medal game last year at the world? What if he gets a gold medal as a night, you know, he's a seventh round pick of Florida playing at Northeastern. What if he gets a gold medal at 19 gets to avenge that world junior loss? Wouldn't that be a good story? Is that worth, is that worth tuning into? Guys are in positions they wouldn't normally be in. The Russians should have the greatest team. They won the gold last time, but it took overtime to beat Team Germany for them to get it. 
Canada came home with a bronze medal. A disappointment, but they're in a group with Germany, the US, and China. Not murderers row. How about tuning in to watch the United States that are full of kids playing NCAA hockey? A lot of them that will be in the NHL. Is that not intriguing? Yeah, I'm not doing ads for Hockey Canada because I don't really like Hockey Canada that much. But I love sports. I love hockey. And I don't need, I don't need NHLers to enjoy a sporting event. That's the only point I'm making here. Will I enjoy watching Matthew Kachuk in the NHL while these games are going on? Yeah, I'll throw them out at the same time. Matthew Kachuk, who's having a career year, 42 points last year, already has 43 this year. Five-point night last night in Calgary's route of the St. Louis Blues. Johnny Goodrow bouncing back, having a great season. You can enjoy them both at the same time. It's called multiple screens. There's a lot to get into this week. I said, Ben Murray's going to join me. The NHL's goal scoring race is, is an interesting, uh, it's heating up right now. You got Chris Kreider, OB right there. Matthews will stay alive in it, I'm sure. DeBrincat, Troy Terry is in the periphery. But the Flames are, are staying hot. You have the Oilers got to win on Saturday night. As we look at the NHL schedule for this evening, um, it some interesting games here. Tonight you got Coyotes, uh, Gold Knights, Hurricanes. Gold Knights get a one nothing win last night. Robin Leonard with a shutout. They go to Carolina to play uh, Freddie Anderson, the Red Hot Canes. Um, tonight it'll be a big night for Keith Yandel. He will break Doug Jarvis's Iron Man streak. He will play in, um, I should find this because I, I believe it's 945th, but I could be wrong. Um, it's, it's an important achievement for sure. Uh, it's something, you know, I, I don't think anybody thought would break. Um, but Keith Yandel, they're playing the se- 964th consecutive regular season game. You know, and it's, it's a crazy achievement. Good for Keith Yandel, you know, played uh, in Moncton, played in the QMJHL. You know, Philly's in the midst of a 12-game losing streak. So they are just – they played just over 40 games this year. They've had two 10-plus game losing streaks in 40 games. It's been a disaster of a season for the Philadelphia Flyers, but something to celebrate for for Keith Yandel tonight. But what's more interesting to me about the Keith Yandel discussion is – and this is, I don't like to skew negative, but it's just a known fact. Stories are more interesting when there's a negative angle. And the interesting thing to me is, well, when after he breaks this record, which will be tonight, when's he a healthy scratch? And I mean that sincerely. Because Keith Yandel is not a great defenseman when it comes to playing the playing a defensive position. He just isn't. He's 35. He's not that mobile. I look at him and I say, when does he play? When does he get a healthy scratch? Because he doesn't have a goal this season. He's known for his offense. He's got 13 points. And for my plus minus people that love plus minus, uh, it's not the be all end all for me, but he's a, for the, for the dinosaurs out there, he's a minus 22 this season. Minus 22. He plays in every game. He's available playing his 43rd game of the season tonight. But if they don't have any takers at the trade deadline, they know they're going to stink. They trade Claude Giroux, trade the assets they need to trade, hope for, prepare for the future. Maybe there's young defensemen they want to play, or maybe they're just sick of watching Keith, Keith Yandel throw a pizza up the middle, get burned in his offensive zone too many times. And they say, you know what? Enough of this. Not saying it will happen, but I think it might. And that'll be interesting to see if it does. But lots to get into. Like I said, interesting games that we'll talk about Keith Yandel tomorrow. Uh, well, Oilers, Canucks, Oilers looking to get their second straight win. Uh, Canucks are going through COVID hell right now. Spencer Martin, their young goalie, will get the start tonight. Uh, Panthers at the Jets. That should be Jets desperately need to pick up some wins here. 
You got Lakers at Brooklyn tonight. No Kyrie Irving, no Kevin Durant. So that puts a little damper on the game. Mavericks at Warriors should be interesting, though. Mavericks have been red hot, winning 11 of the last 12. And also you know, the Australian Open. What a performance from Denis Shapovalov uh, last night. He goes five sets with Rafael Nadal, coming from two sets down to force a fifth. But ultimately, Nadal, he knows how to find that energy, to will it into, you know, last night he, he found a way to win. And winning 6-3 in the fifth set, Shapo fought back valiantly, but he couldn't do it. Later in the night, Matteo Berrettini was up two sets to love on Mafis. Mafis won three and four. Berrettini ultimately pulled it out in the fifth. So it would be Berrettini versus Nadal in the first men's semi. We know it'll be Ash Barty, the world number one against Madison Keys. And the winner of that match will win the Australian Open, in my opinion. Keys has been playing flawless, as has um, Barty, who won 6-2, 6 bagel last night. Tonight, you got two, the two women's semifinals, which is Danielle Collins, the American against Elise Cornet, the qualifier that made it through, and I guess Switek, who's a French Open champion against Kai Kanepi. And then the men's draw tonight, you have Sissy Pass, the world number four against Yannick Sinner, the world number 11, who's a, a promising up-and-comer. And you have Canadian Felix Ogialiasin playing world number two, Daniil Medvedev. So more Canadian men's tennis, good showing from Shabavalov. We'll see what Ogialiasin can do this evening. We'll touch on that tomorrow, amongst other things. But have a great night, everybody. Seamus is away with, uh, with the family tonight, so we're going to give him the night uh, to see the family kind of recoup. He, we'll be hitting uh, our our breakdown of sneaky peak tomorrow. So double dose of podcasts coming your way tomorrow. So stay tuned for that, but as always stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll talk then.